Welcome again to Kingdom Theater. I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Father in heaven, as we open your word tonight, it's with joyful hearts. We want to know what you have for us to know. And not everyone may believe just as I believe. We pray that each will be gentle towards the other. And we pray that each of us will welcome your Holy Spirit. May we all be willing to embrace truth no matter where we may find it. We thank you for hearing our prayers and leading us now into this study. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Do you know what this building is? Or do you know what this building is? Or maybe this building? Or have you seen inside of this place? Or maybe in this place? Or here? Each of these buildings has something in common. The two top ones are pictures of the United States Supreme Court. All the rest are state Supreme Courts. Mississippi, North Carolina, Tennessee, and some other places. The fact is society is based on law and order. What if we had no law and order? There would be chaos there would be confusion. And that raises the question then, are God's Ten Commandments out of date? Are they old-fashioned? Are they restrictive? Are they something for the past? Or is there still value for today? Some say that God's law is no more. It's been done away with. And we don't follow God's law. Fact is, God's law is like a compass, and we need a compass. We need some guidance in our lives to know what is best, what direction to take. Do You know, the story is recorded in the Old Testament about Lucifer. He thought he didn't need God's law, thought he could do things on his own, do it his way. Why, such good people, why would we need the law anyway? Well, God wanted to remind us, and so on the tablets of stone, written with the finger of God, he wrote his law. He gave it to Moses. Is that when the law first began? Or has the law been around since before that time? Yes, God's law was written in stone. And remember, when there is a law, that means there is a law maker. Laws do not write themselves. They don't make themselves. In this case, God is the lawgiver. Then there is the question of accountability to the lawgiver. Breaking the law means we'll have to face the judge. We are responsible for disobedience. Even without getting caught, there are still consequences to law-breaking. They happen quite naturally. Without being told about the law, we still have a sense of right and wrong. Our sense of right and wrong can be somewhat perverted, however, depending on what we have exposed ourselves to. Moral thinking may actually be immoral thinking if our morality has been affected by what we have exposed our minds to. Proverbs 28, 26 says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. What is it saying? I'm following my own standard. I'm doing what I think is good. Trust in my own heart is a fool. Let anyone who thinks he stands... Take heed lest he falls, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. It doesn't matter who you are, while you are living and breathing, there is a potential for you to fall, to fail. Just because of position, just because of history, just because of who your parents were or the positions that they held in God's service doesn't mean that you will not fail. We need guidance, each of us. So we have God's Ten Commandment law, we have morality which comes within us, and then what about civil law? Those are three different kinds of laws. That brings us to the question of jurisdiction. 
jurisdiction. The law giver has jurisdiction over the realm of his law. And the law makers have jurisdiction over the laws which they make. Any state cannot change the laws of another state. Any country cannot change the laws of another country. Simple fact. Before we go any further talking about law, though, I want to be clear. Let it be distinctly understood that there is no salvation in the law. That is, there is no redeeming quality in the law. James White wrote that. Do you know who James White is? He's one of three of the major founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. James White. And then there is Captain Joseph Bates. Now, Captain Bates thought that there was some role to play in salvation of keeping the law. That we, in some way we were contributing to our salvation by keeping the law. That our law keeping earned us some part of our salvation. James White said, there is no salvation in the law. James White appealed to the people to obey and honor God by keeping his commandments. For White, it was all important to have living, active faith in Jesus. If I say I love Jesus and I trust Jesus and I follow Jesus, then I will want to hear what he has to say even when he whispers it and I will want to follow it. Speaking of the Millerite message in 1850, you familiar with that phrase? In the 1800s, there was a man named William Miller. He was a Baptist farmer, and he studied his Bible, and he drew some conclusions, and God miraculously asked him to start preaching about those Bible prophecies. Out of that movement came the Seventh-day Adventist church. Speaking of the Millerite message in 1850, he declared that it led us to the feet of Jesus to seek forgiveness of all our sins and a free and full salvation through the blood of Christ. Free and full salvation. Our law keeping does not contribute to our salvation. Does it mean we should not obey God? Hmm, we'll deal with that in a minute. Saved people are keepers of the law. Saved people are keepers of the law. Not to be saved, but because they love and respect the law giver. I am not my father's son because I obey him. I obey him because I am my father's son. And when I disobey him, it would make him sad. And I can remember making him sad. And I can remember crawling into his lap and thankful for his forgiveness. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Anyone wants to quote a law keeper, that would be the apostle Paul. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You catch that? We were created, God's workmanship, we were created for good works. God did not make us to do bad things. He asked us to do what is good and to walk in the way that he directs us to walk in. Hosea 8, 7, Old Testament. For they sowed the wind and they will reap the whirlwind. There are consequences when we sin. Government, jurisdiction, does not reach to heaven's laws. A government has a third authority and jurisdiction over its own laws. Government jurisdiction does not reach to heaven's 
laws. And history reveals that when church and state unite, the rights of the minority are trampled on. Remember Daniel 2, 21? It says, God, he removes kings and raises up kings. God's kingdom is over all earthly kingdoms. And Jesus is referred to as the king of kings. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. Psalm 111 Verse 7 and 8. They are sure, they are dependable, and they endure. They stand fast forever and ever. So wrote the psalmist. The law of the Lord is perfect, Psalm 19, verse 7. Can you improve on perfect? It says the law of the Lord is perfect. It is estimated. There have been 35 million laws to control human behavior. But the God of all creation has given us Just Ten Commandments. Major principles to guide us in our relationships. The principles of God's law are unchanging. They are eternal. And they are rooted in love. Again, written with the finger of God in the tables of stone. And he wants us to believe they are enduring. That's what you put in tables of stone. Things that are to last. God's law is the basis of heaven's government. Every government has laws. It's how we know how to operate and relate to one another. So how did God relate to the rebellion in heaven? You remember we read about it. Lucifer was choosing his own way, making insinuations about God that Lucifer could have a better kingdom. He'd be a better king than God was. God did everything he could to restore Lucifer to his place. You can see through scripture that's how God works. But what did God ultimately have to do? That's right. Lucifer and all of the angels who chose to go with him were cast out of heaven. And what about on this earth? Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. In both cases, these are individuals, angelic or human, And they were followers of God, but they deviated. They went another way. They no longer listened 100% to God's voice. And as a result, they had to leave. And then there's Cain and Abel. Cain, who slew his brother Abel, was sent far away. He could no longer dwell among the people because he disregarded God's law. Romans chapter 4, verse 15 says, Where there is no law, there is no transgression. So when did the law begin? Transgression is the breaking or violation of any law, civil or moral, according to Webster's Dictionary. When did God's law begin? 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. Is this saying that until Mount Sinai, when God gave those Ten Commandments, no one sinned? Hardly. We see murder. We see all of these things before that time. Genesis 26, 5, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Abraham? Abraham was the father of Isaac, who begat Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Ah, and it was the children of Israel who received the Ten Commandments. Clearly, Abraham knew God had laws. Fact. In the Old Testament, God's law was the standard of right and wrong. It was not left to every man to think as he chose. The words of Jesus, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Ah, fulfill. Don't think that fulfill means do away with, because that would be to say, do not think that I came to destroy, but I came to destroy. It's double talk. No, he said, I did not come to destroy, 
but I came to make even more full. Jesus died to save us from our sins. He did not die to make it possible for us to sin. God's law is still the standard. Matthew 5, 17, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Not even the dotting of an I, the crossing of a T, the smallest mark will depart from God's law. Jesus has come to fill to the full God's law so that in every way we value it. God's law and Calvary. Calvary occurred because of God's love for fallen man. Calvary was God's answer. Jesus said it's easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of the pen to drop out of the law. Another version says, are you saying the law didn't end at the cross? That's exactly what I'm saying. We remember the cross in the midst of the 70th week of that prophecy. A.D. 31, Jesus was crucified. And don't forget, Jesus is the center of the 70th week. It's not Satan and it's not anyone else. It's not Antichrist. It is Jesus. And it was in A.D. 31 that Jesus was crucified. And with him, something happened. In the midst of the 70th week, Christ, the Messiah, would cause the sacrifice to cease. We covered this in a recent episode. Mark 15, 38 says, Then the veil of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. Not by men. They would tear from the bottom where they could reach. This was a very tall drapery, very thick. Torn in two, indicating what? That the ceremonial, sacrificial system was ended. It died with Jesus at the cross. It was nailed with Jesus to the cross. That is the law that ended at the cross. They rejected Jesus. They rejected his followers and their message. They stoned Stephen. And that's when the gospel was taken to the Gentile world. Before that, the children of Israel were called to all be a priesthood of people to take the gospel to the world. God's grace does not replace God's law. Having abolished in his flesh... That is when he was crucified. The enmity, the conflict, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. God's Ten Commandment law has no ordinances. They are straightforward principles. Ordinances are rituals and routines that are given for instructive value. That is what came to an end at the cross. No more ordinances, no more sacrificial services. All of those things were given to us to point forward to Jesus. You think about it, the Lamb of God. John the Baptist was baptizing and Jesus came. John 1.29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. Throughout Scripture, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. In the book of Revelation, chapter 13, 8, written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Written in the book of life of the Lamb. The book of life of the Lamb. The book of life of the Lamb. Is your name written in God's Lamb's book? The one who is slain. The offer was made from the foundation of the world to die for us. Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. He didn't say the law doesn't matter. Go and sin no more. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12. Do you know? Why would we even need grace if there was no law? Hammering away at God's law, attempting to destroy God's law is not following God. Jesus always leads to obedience. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. On uh, foreign fields, you don't see too many sheep walking around here. But as the shepherds would meet on the country roads and their sheep were following them, the sheep got all mixed up as the two shepherds visit. And then when they parted their ways, each shepherd just said, call the name, called the sheep. And the sheep said, I know that voice. And the sheep followed the voice of the one that they knew. If you love me, you will follow my voice, follow my commandments, Jesus said. John 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. This is love for God, to obey His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, why would anyone want to keep the law? If you love the lawgiver, you will want to keep his law. Didn't Jesus teach that all we need is to love? Jesus certainly did teach that we need to love. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. This is the first and great commandment. Verse 38. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 39, there you have it. You just need to love everybody. True? But the very next verse says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All of the other teachings of the Old Testament scriptures hang on these two points. Love to God, love to your fellow man, the first four of the commands of the ten, love to God, and the last six, love to your fellow men. On these two points hang the whole law. Love is the basis and the foundation of God's law. Love always leads to obedience. It never leads to disobedience. Oh, I have to back up and look at that picture. Do you see that picture? This young man had lost hope. And he climbed over the fence, over the railing, and he was ready to jump into the river. And someone came up and said, what's going on, friend? And began to talk with him. And one by one, people started to grab him. Someone grabbed his belt. Someone grabbed his legs. Someone came up with a rope, and they wrapped the rope around him and tied him so that he couldn't jump. Another man put his arms around the neck of this man. He had lost hope, and he was ready to jump. He was ready to end it all. But love has a better way. Love wants to redeem. Love wants to reclaim. Love wants to lead us in a happier conclusion. Obedience is always a happier way. Losing your life, that's a terrible thing. And we need to have that burden for one another. Is law observance the basis of our salvation? Well, again, we read, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Saved by grace, it's a gift. No one can boast of keeping God's law. Grace always leads to obedience. It never leads to disobedience. Doesn't the Bible teach that we're not under the law? What does it mean to be under the law? Romans 6, 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law but under grace. Sin no longer has to control your life because you're not under the law but under grace. Why? Because grace changes us. We want to serve the lawgiver. 
what then shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Romans 6.15. Sin is breaking God's law. Because I have grace, does that cause me to say it's okay to just go live my life of sin? God loves me. You know, my dad loved me too, but he really did not want me to disobey. If I ran out into the street, it was at great risk. And when I disobey God's law, it's at great risk. Law keeping is for our benefit, for our blessing. Yes, grace is needed because we are sinners. We are transgressors of the law. And law observance is not a system. It's not a method of salvation. Grace saves us from our sins, not in our sins. The law has its purpose. It's there for a reason, not to save us. The law has its purpose. We read, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Everyone who wants instruction can put themselves under the law. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh, no human being will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. James speaks about looking in a mirror and realizing we have something on our face that doesn't belong there. You don't rub your face against the mirror to get clean. That's where you need the soapy water. That's where you need the grace of God. The law tells us when a change is needed, and that drives us to Jesus, our Savior. Grace works because the law tells us we have a need. If we didn't know that we were in crisis spiritually, we wouldn't even know to seek Jesus. God's law is a blessing. To be under grace means to accept God's grace as a means of salvation. God's grace is a means. It is the only means of salvation. And by faith, I accept Christ's death in place of my sins. Again, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. We make it even more full, more valued. Jesus died to save me from sin. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. To know, in the biblical sense, to be intimately acquainted with, to be close to God. I cannot say, I know God, He is my God, He is my Savior, and then at the same time go out and be a lawbreaker. I'm just not being truthful. Do you know what this is a picture of? That's the Isle of Patmos. The island of Patmos. And on that island, John was given more than one message. He writes, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. Woman, a symbol of God's people. And went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Is this written in the Old Testament? No, it's written in the New Testament. It's written after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Who keep the commandments of God. Satan is enraged and is angry going after the people of God who keep the commandments of God. Saved by commandment keeping? Not at all. Rather, and have the faith, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Christ. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12, another text talking about God's commandments. Keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Why do I obey? That's our question tonight. Why would anyone want to keep the law? 
Because law-keeping is what we do when we value the one who speaks the law. Christ's love compels us to serve him. We are motivated from love to serve him. We are not motivated from being scared to death. That's a very short-term motivation. It is the compelling love of Jesus when we are at the foot of the cross. God's law, written in stone. Written in stone. It's meant to last. We've read that it's eternal. It's everlasting. We need God's law. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are weak human beings. The devil tempts us. We have hereditary tendencies that have come from our parents. We have cultivated tendencies to evil that we have encouraged in our own lives. Tonight, Lord, we want to surrender this all to you. We want the infilling of your Holy Spirit, and we want a renewed nature so that serving you is what we really desire. Help us to seek you when we are feeling tempted. We know that it is your grace that solves our problems, not just legally, but actually brings healing to our sinful nature. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We want to serve you because we love you. When we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. The song says it only takes a spark to set a whole fire going. And once the fire was lit in one part of Europe, it spread quickly to other areas. John Wycliffe had made a massive impact, not just in England, but further afield in Europe, in particular here in Prague, and the region that was known then as Bohemia. John Huss was of humble birth and his father died soon after he was born. His mother sought an education for him and he was able to get admission to the University of Prague as a charity scholar. As she reached Prague with her son, she knelt down and prayed that God would bless his life, a prayer that was answered again and again. He soon distinguished himself by his tireless application to study and by his blameless life. Upon completing his studies, he entered the priesthood and rapidly rose to prominence, soon becoming attached to the court of the king. In a few short years, he was the pride of his country and his name was known all over Europe. Today, they've built a statue to commemorate him here in the Old Town Square. Several years after becoming a priest, Huss was appointed preacher of the Bethlehem Chapel here in Prague. The founder of this particular chapel had advocated as a matter of importance the preaching of the scriptures in the language of the people. At that time, there was a large degree of ignorance concerning the Bible, and Huss also believed that it was vitally important to preach the scriptures in the language of the people. At this point in his life, Huss came in contact with Jerome, 
who had proved to be his right-hand man until his death. Jerome was a citizen of Prague, and he had brought back with him from a recent trip to England the writings of John Wycliffe. The Queen of England at that time was also a convert of John Wycliffe, and she was a Bohemian princess, and through her influence, his writings were circulated at length in Bohemia. Huss read them, believed their author to be a sincere Christian, and believed the writings to be true. Huss's impact was growing, not just here in his homeland, but also in neighboring Germany. And soon news of the work here in Prague reached Rome, and he was summoned to appear before the Pope. To go would be fatal. The king and queen of Bohemia, the nobility and the government all asked for a local trial, but this was not granted. The trial of Huss went ahead in his absence, during which the city of Prague was put under interdict. This struck terror into the hearts of everyone. No church services could take place. Baptisms, funerals, weddings, those ceremonies that were so key to life in general were not allowed to take place. And through this means, Rome was able to hold sway over the people. The city was in turmoil, and Sir Huss withdrew to his native village, but he continued to travel to the surrounding countryside where he was able to preach to eager crowds. When the danger and excitement had subsided, he was able to return to Prague, where alongside with Jerome, he was able to continue his work. During this time in Europe, there was not one or two but three rival popes, all claiming to be the Vicar of Christ. This abuse of power in the church was something that many men strongly condemned, Huss being one of the loudest voices. The emperor at that time, Emperor Sigismund, called for a council in Constance, Germany, to settle this dispute once and for all, and also to deal with some of the new heresies arising from men such as John Huss that they didn't agree with. Huss was summoned to appear before the council and was given assurance of a safe passage by the emperor. One thing that stands out from this story is the prayer that John Huss's mum made with him as he was on his way to university. I want to encourage you, if you're praying for a child, if you're praying for a parent, to never give up in your prayers. The prayer of John Huss's mother was answered many, many times over in ways that she couldn't have even imagined. Maybe you're praying for your children, maybe they're on their way to school, maybe you're praying for a loved one. Keep them in prayer and never think that our prayers will go unanswered. God does hear and God does answer our prayers. <laughs>